My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. This podcast is entitled, Applying Digital to the Carbon Conundrum. If your goal is to tackle climate change with all the tools at your disposal, what digital tools should hold a spot in your arsenal? The Dilemma It's possible to hold two opposite ideas at once and still function. I accept the science of climate change and that human activity, particularly the burning of fossil fuels, is having an effect on the climate. Over the years, I've had the fortune on multiple occasions to visit the same location of Australia's Great Barrier Reef at the same time of year, and the changes I've directly observed have been shocking. Even if you personally don't believe in climate change, the next generation of consumers seem convinced, and they're walking out of school to transmit their signal. I also observe that the fossil fuel industry has been instrumental in bringing prosperity to much human existence by bringing light to the dark, heat to the cold, and force to the inert. From 1993 to 1995, I worked regularly in China, and my photos from that time are very revealing. Blue skies, bicycles everywhere, no cars, no streetlights, and door-to-door coal delivery by donkey cart. Coal plus iron ore plus oil has lifted 500 million people out of poverty by hyperextending the performance of the agricultural, transportation, and manufacturing sectors. Keep doing what we're doing, and we'll surely move 500 million more people into the middle class and lift the remaining 500 million out of poverty, but at the expense of possibly irreversible damage to our earthly Garden of Eden. We're all about to be tasked with figuring out a new balance between our use of energy, the economies that power our lifestyles, and our impact on the natural environment, the triple E for short. The IEA has identified digital innovation as one of the key tools that can help decarbon our societies, extend our use of fossil fuels, and enable our transition to newer forms of energy aimed at striking that new balance. Progress blockers. Assume that the environment is the reactive participant of this trio. The environment reacts to how we create and use energy and how our economies consume our resources to sustain our lifestyles. It falls to humans to manage proactively the energy and economy elements of the triple E. According to Dr. Asim Prakash of the University of Washington, there are four challenges that society faces as it aims for that new balance. First is the tragedy of the commons. The cost of making changes to our energy use or to our economies through regulation or taxation are localized to specific jurisdictions, but the benefits accrue globally beyond our borders. GHGs inconsiderately ignore national borders. We can clean our air in Canada, but what's the point if China doesn't follow suit? Number two is the fairness equation. The consequences of choices in energy use or how our economies operate penalizes some segments of society while benefiting others. We can ban pipelines into BC to avoid possible coastal fouling, but that's unfair to BC oil workers trying to supply oil for BC's forestry industry. Third is just simply flagrant hypocrisy. We feel all virtuous because we are furious recyclers or we embrace the 100-mile diet while we live in Truckatokes, drive our Ford 150s to buy groceries, and vacation in Puerto Vallarta. Celebrities and executives chartered over a 1,000 private jets to fly to Davos in 2019 to discuss the Triple E. Climate change is someone else's problem. And finally is the agency perception. We tell ourselves that any personal contribution we make to solve the climate problem doesn't matter because tiny changes are irrelevant. Canada is just 1.8% of global GHG emissions. China emits the same quantity of GHG as Canada every 25 days. So we cut emissions by 50%. So what? I hold these two conflicting ideas at the same time, that the very thing that has lifted us into prosperity, comfort, and flourishing is also threatening our climate. Things have to change, but creating winners and losers in the shift only breeds more yellow vest demonstrations. The actors in our Triple E equation have limited levers to pull to drive change, and here's just a few to consider. How about government actions? 
To change social behaviors in an economy or an energy use, governments can create a price signal by imposing a carbon tax or by implementing a cap and trade market or by regulating for emissions. And then there are NGO moves. To maintain pressure on the other actors, non-governmental organizations or NGOs can maintain registries of big emitters, conduct name and shame campaigns, pressure investors to decarbonize their portfolios, intervene in energy and economic proposals, and litigate for change. And then there are business changes. To maintain their brands, avoid climate risks, and continue their growth, businesses can adopt carbon accounting alongside other measurements, implement voluntary greening programs, transform their supply chains, or implement an internal carbon price. And then there are the personal actions for the rest of us. We're encouraged to go vegetarian, as meat is one of the most egregious carbon sources. Adopt electric transportation, if it's available. Put solar panels on our house, if you have an idle 15,000 that might never pay off. Fly less, no more sunny holidays. And finally, to put on a sweater. In a race between fossil fuels and technology, I posit that technology is going to win. Technology is surfing Moore's law of exponential improvements, while fossil fuel energy plods along with marginal gains. Eventually, as technology is applied to the Triple E challenge, it will find winning solutions. Here's just a few levers for carbon management that are highly susceptible to digital innovation. Number one is emissions tracking. I've been in any number of meeting rooms with some poster of a racing yacht or a pit crew, underwritten with some syrupy business truth about measuring things. What gets measured gets rewarded. You can't fix what you can't measure. In God we trust. Everyone else bring data. Subjectivity measures nothing consistently. And finally, if you can measure it, it's not love. Most of the SCADA systems of the past were not designed for emissions tracking. Adding an army of expensive engineering talent or management accounting people to measure emissions is not plausible for many companies and industries. This is a job for automation, the Internet of Things, and analytics. Number two is cap and trade. Inventing credits for carbon emitted and not emitted, pricing those credits, enabling the trading of credits, only an economist would come up with such an elegant answer that combines everything you don't understand about stock markets with everything you don't understand about greenhouse gases. Blockchain could be the solution to uniquely identify a carbon credit so that it is not counted twice and manages the credit through its life cycle of purchase, sale, exchange, and disposal. And then there's working from wherever. Digital innovations are already enabling a huge shift in work to the gig economy. Cloud computing, encryption tools, collaboration technologies, gamification, augmented reality, AI, and other digital tools allow workers more freedom than ever to work from wherever they happen to be, rather than in the office of the past. As we adopt the latest telecom standards, even more work options will open up. And then there's the automation of equipment. There's a lot of driving around in oil and gas because the assets in the industry are spread out. Just for fun, use Google Earth to zero in on Odessa, Texas and check out all the oil wells far from civilization. The industry really needs smarter assets that self-manage, using the data from their own sensors and interpreted by their own onboard artificial intelligence engines. This will trim the requirement for people to drive long distance, a really carbon-intense activity, to visually inspect the equipment, check fluid levels, record, record data from gauges, and carry out routine maintenance. And then there's supply chain greening. I've been involved in hundreds of supply chain businesses, and in the past, carbon has rarely factored into any thinking about the design of the supply chain. Consider the running shoe. The design is from California, but the upper might be cotton sourced from Pakistan, which is woven and dyed in India and cut in Vietnam. The lowers may be cast in factories in Eastern Europe, but stitched to the uppers in Chinese factories. Eyelets are punched out in Taiwan, laces might come from Colombia, with plastic eyes attached in China. The cardboard box is from the US, ink and labels are from Germany, final packaging is completed in southern China, and finally the shoes are shipped to the US for markets. Clearly, the carbon impacts of these logistics did not influence the supply chain configuration. Additive manufacturing will be one of the key digital tools that helps industry rethink the supply chain design with carbon in mind. Then there are a few low-impact levers. Here's some of the levers for carbon management that are just not as susceptible to digital innovation and may be addressed using existing tools. First is carbon accounting. With a handle on actual emissions, 
The next step is to account for the emissions, the volumes, the intensity, timing, and source activities. The accounting enables the accountability, or the pressure on someone to act on the accounting. The business gene for making things better here kicks in, with plans, budgets, targets, timetables, penalties, and rewards. You can see it in action at Shell, who now tie manager bonuses to carbon impacts. And next is carbon pricing. A surefire way to get managers to pay attention to something is to give it a cost. They can then weigh up whether to invest to yield the best cost or the productivity outcome. Managers don't need a real carbon price to take action. They can equally use a phantom price or a shadow price. And finally, sweaters. Just lower the thermometer and put on a sweater. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.